So you guys ready for summer? You know, it's here whether you're ready or not. I went outside this morning to talk to our parking ministry guys. I got about five steps out the front door. I said hi to them from a distance, and I turned around and came back inside. So summer is here. Well, author Trevor Moad tells the story about a very successful business entrepreneur. And what makes this story noteworthy isn't how the story ends, it's how it starts. So back in the late 1980s, this entrepreneur was in high school, and he was really struggling. He was in and out of suspension, running with the wrong crowd, getting horrible grades, doing all of the things you're not supposed to do. And he was about to get expelled from his junior year. He was very close. And his mom sat him down and pleaded with him to do the right thing and to try to clean up his act. And so as part of this discussion, he promised his mom that he'd take the SAT test for college. He mainly did it just to get his mom off his back. But then in May, he took the test. And in June, he got the results, and he didn't expect much from it, but he opened the results, and he got a 1480 out of 1600. If you don't know much about the SAT, that's a really good score. It would, back at that time, it would have gotten you into almost any Ivy League school. It was so good that his mom accused him of cheating on the SAT, and his defense to his mom was, Mom, I don't care enough to cheat. But anyway, after he got this 1480, things began to change for him he began to go to class because, you know, if you're a 1480 student, you don't skip class. And 1480 students, they don't just go to class, but they study and try to get good grades. And so that's what he did. And he began to hang out with the kids that are concerned about grades and are concerned about what college they're going to go to. And his teachers realized that he got a 1480 and it word spread around. And so they began to kind of pour into him in a different way than he had before. And Because he knew he was a 1480 student, he began to live like a 1480 student. Out of who he was, he began to change the way he lived. And so when he graduated from high school, he had to go to junior college for one year because his grades were so bad from the first three years that he couldn't get into a major university. But after one year of junior college, he got into an Ivy League school and he went to, and he graduated from Ivy League school, and then he went on to become a very successful entrepreneur in the magazine industry. And so, you know, being a 1480 affected who he was. Twelve years later, he got a letter from the SAT board. He didn't even open it for a few days, because why in the world would the SAT board be sending him anything that mattered? But after a few days, he decided to open the letter, and the letter said this, you were one of 13 students who got the wrong SAT grade. Your SAT grade was actually not a 1480, it was actually a 740, half, which is not a good score. And it will not get you into most colleges, much less Ivy League schools. But what happened is, who he became affected how he thought, and how he thought then affected how he behaved, and it changed his life, his status, impacted the way he lived. Well, we're in the middle of our sermon series called Supreme, where we're going chapter by chapter through this book of Colossians. And if you probably already heard this, if you've been here, but Colossians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae, and it was written about 62 AD. So that's written about 30 years, maybe even a little less, after Jesus dies and rises from the dead and then goes back to heaven. And So we've seen this, and we've been studying this for the last two weeks. And in the first two weeks, it's this really picture, this beautiful picture of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. It is the gospel message. And so in week one, I talked about how great our God is and the amazing grace that we experience through God. And then last week, Chris talked about how we're not saved by following the rules, but we're saved by having a relationship with Jesus who did all of this for us. But now in chapter 3, Paul is going to change gears pretty dramatically. He's going to go from talking about what was done for us to how do we respond? How do we live our lives coming out of that beauty and grace of the gospel? In in other words, he's talking about rules. And we love rules, don't we? I mean, some of you guys probably actually like the rules. You know who you are. You're sick individuals. You are excited that we're finally to the practical part of Colossians, and you're excited about hearing what the rules are so you can follow them. But look, I know who you are. You're sick individuals. You're the people that take defensive driving because you like it. You don't take it because you got a ticket. You take it to lower your insurance premiums. 
and you're the only one on the airplane that actually listens to the safety briefing because, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. You probably even take out the little card and familiarize yourself with all the exits. If the, if the plane crashes, you do not need to know where the exits are. Just walk out the big hole in the side of the plane. I know who you sick individuals are that like the rules. You're the ones that got to your seats five minutes before service started today. But for most of us, talking about the rules is is a bit of a downer. It's not exciting. But what we're going to see in chapter 3 today is that it's not about rules. It is about a change in mindset. It's about change behavior that flows out of our changed identity because of who we are. And the change from who we were, our behavior flows out of that. All right, let's look at that together. This is Colossians 3. We're going to start in verses 1 through 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And and so Paul starts out here, and he's talking to Christians. The first two uh, chapters, he's talking to everybody about who God is, how we respond to that. But here, he's saying, for those of you that have been raised with Christ, there's something different about you. You're not who you once were. And out of that new identity ought to come change behavior. Does that make sense? Because we are now 1480 people. We begin to live like 1480 people. We're not just following rules. Our behavior is because of our new status. And and so Paul here in these first four verses says, look, set your eyes on heavenly things, not on earthly things. Look up to where Jesus is and focus on that. Don't focus on the earthly things. And it's important to understand here that he's not just talking about sinful versus non-sinful behavior. He's talking about a change in mindset, a complete transformation of who we are. And so he's saying, look, don't don't focus on this life, focus on eternity. I love how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I love that. I think about that like the focus of a camera. Like if you're going to take the picture of somebody and they're up close, but then there's these beautiful mountains or a waterfall or something off in the distance, you've got to decide what you're going to focus the camera on. Because if you focus up close, it's going to be a little blurry back in that beautiful setting. If you focus on the the setting off in the distance, what's up close is going to be a little blurry. You have to choose where your primary focus is. And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that our primary focus shouldn't be on this life it should be on eternity. And look, I get how hard that is for us. It's hard for me because what we see and touch is this life. It's what we feel. It's what we're experiencing. But the reminder to us is this. Whether you get 30 years or you get 130 years, this life is short. I can't believe I've already got blown through nearly 56 years They fly by, and no matter how long you live, you will one day spend all of eternity in eternity. And so our focus should be more on that, more on the things of that life rather than this life. Our behavior changes because of who we now are. Does that make sense? Our identity affects how we live our life. All right. Now, the first four verses are very general about just this mindset But in verse 5, Paul's going to get very specific about some sins that we have to get away from. They're sins of our old life. Look at what he says here in verse 5. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. That sounds very different than what Paul was talking about in the first two chapters, right? First two chapters, he's talking about how great God is and how amazing grace is. Now he says, put to death what is of your old nature, these sinful things. He's talking about some sins that have the ability to destroy us in this first part. And so he uses some pretty graphic imagery. He says, put to death. And if you look back at the Greek, that's exactly the imagery it gives. It says exterminate or kill off is the the idea that it gives. Because these things present an incredible danger to us. So this is a big change from the gospel of grace in the first two chapters, right? The gospel of grace is so beautiful. It's all Jesus, and we should celebrate that. We should live out of that beautiful grace of Jesus. 
But Paul's saying along the way, you got some work to do. Because of that grace, you got a little dirty work to do. You got to kill off some things that are no longer who you are. Because if you don't, those struggles, those temptations will eventually get the better of you and they'll lead to your spiritual death. Paul's saying here, it's either kill or be killed. And that's pretty graphic imagery he's using. Have you guys ever heard of a guy named Timothy Treadwell? He was known as the Grizzly Man. Do y'all remember that? Back in the late 90s, 2000s, early 2000s, this guy went to Alaska every summer and he camped out with the Grizzlies. And he would get these amazing pictures and these amazing videos of him being up close and personal with these huge, dangerous grizzly bears that weigh you know, up to 1,000 pounds. There's pictures of him touching some of these big bears. There's pictures of him playing with the, the bear cubs. And the uh, wildlife officials and the park rangers were like, God, this is going to turn ugly. You can't do this. They even fined him for some ways that he was interacting with wildlife that didn't meet the regulations of the parks. But for 13 straight years, he seemed to have this unique and amazing relationship with grizzly bears. But in 2003, it it turned ugly. He had gone up there camping for the summer with his girlfriend, and everything was fine through most of the summer. They'd actually decided to stay a couple of extra weeks. And then one day they didn't check in the way they were supposed to on the radio, and so a plane was sent to check on him, and when the pilot got over the camp, he could see that the camp was in complete disarray. He could see that there was a male grizzly bear that was patrolling the camp like he was guarding prey. And so the park rangers were called in, and the park rangers found pieces of Treadwell's body all over the camp. They found his girlfriend mostly in one piece, kind of half buried behind where the tents were in a, in a shallow little dig. And they wound up having to kill the big grizzly bear that was there because it charged them and attacked them when they were trying to recover the bodies. And they actually did a postmortem on this big grizzly bear, and their worst fears were discovered. They found parts of human flesh inside its system. See, Treadwell didn't realize that these apex predators could kill him. He thought that he had the ability to live at peace with these dangerous animals. And he failed to understand that you can't hang around with things that will kill you and not expect to eventually be killed. And and see, that's the point Paul is making here. He's making a very graphic point to us because he wants us to understand you can't hang around with some of these things and not expect for them to eventually get you. And then, so Paul is now going to list off a couple of sins that we're to get away with. These are the sins that we have to put to death. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So he first focuses on this idea of sexual immorality. And then he throws some other words in to make sure we don't miss how serious he is. Impurity, lust, and evil desires to make sure that we understand how dangerous sexual sin is. Because sexual sin was a big deal to the church 2,000 years ago. And it's still a really big deal to the church today. You know, and I think the biggest mistake that the church has made over the years with this issue of sexual sin is we focus too much on behavior. We, We talk about the rules all the time, do this, don't do that. And that seems to be the primary focus that we have. But this issue really isn't about behavior at all. It's about living out of who you now are. And ultimately, it's about your belief. What do you believe about how you got here? Because see, if you believe you got here by random chance, that it was all some accident, then it makes perfect sense that you would live how you want to live. That you would, as long as it's consenting adults, you would do whatever it is you want to do. Anything goes. But if you look at sexuality through the lens of Christianity through the lens of that there is an all-powerful, all-knowing creator God who made you and made everything, then we can't really believe that our sexuality happened without that same God creating and implementing that as part of his plan. And, And if that's true, then we have to look at this issue of sexuality not through the lens of ourselves, but from the lens of the plan and purpose of his creation. And if that's true, then sex is less about your desire and more about his design. It's less about your pleasure and more about his plan. It's less about your passion and more about his purpose. 
Sexual intimacy is a gift from God to enhance and sustain his overall plan for creation. Let me give you the real quick plan for creation. His goal was for humans to flourish. He says this in, the, in Genesis, to flourish and multiply. And the way he designed that to happen is through a family of one man, one mom, woman married for a lifetime because he created that to be the structure to best raise kids. And so in this context of marriage between one man and one woman, he gave us this incredible gift of sexuality to bond the husband and wife together to help them get through difficult times. That's his plan. And see, in that context, sex is beautiful. Sex is good. It is a gift from God. But outside that context, it's sin that has to be put to death. The Greek word that's translated in this phrase, sexual immorality, in verse 5, is a word called pornaya. And pornaya, you can probably recognize it, it's where we get our word pornographic or pornography. This word was kind of a catch-all phrase for any sex outside God's plan. And, and, you know, sometimes when the Bible talks about sexual sin, it'll go on to give a list of very specific sexual sins and a listing but most often, it just uses this word pornaya to refer to this sexual sin. And so pornaya, if you look back at the Greek, it, it includes a number of things. It includes sex before marriage, sex between close relatives, sex with animals, sex between two men, or sex between two women. God's design for sexuality was intended to be solely between one man, one woman for one lifetime in the context of a marriage. But, but see, our culture, it, it tries to tell, talk about sexuality in a way that strips away this ultimate purpose, this design in it. And it just kind of says, look, it's just whatever you want. And culture really teaches us two big ideas. And I want you to understand this. There's two big ideas that our culture tries to teach us about sex. One of them is partially true. And one of them is completely false. But if you think about these two ideas... They actually conflict with one another, and they can't really go together, but culture tries to say that they do. So here's the first big idea that we're taught. Sex is a big deal. If you're not having sex, you're missing out, you're messing up. And, and so you can recognize that by watching movies or television shows. My goodness, in a TV series, uh, whether it's on the internet or on the old style TVs, you see your main character's you know, they are, you know, they have a relationship, they, they get almost to the point where they have sex and hook up, and then, you know, things happen and it doesn't happen, and other boyfriends and girlfriends come in, and all the time, and then finally it happens, and there's this track playing with cheering in the background, and music playing, and clapping, and it's the best episode ever in most of our minds, because what that's communicating is that it's a big deal, and it's partially right. Sex is a big deal, but not in the context in which it's portrayed. But at the same time, culture tells us that sex is a big deal. Culture says something that's counter to that. Sex is no big deal, right? It's like a, a roller coaster in an amusement park. I mean, you just get on and ride and ride and ride with whoever you want, whenever you want, and there's no risk, there's no danger. Just do what feels good. Enjoy the, the, the sexual intimacy with whoever you choose. But this is a lie. The, the culture would tell us it's no big deal. It's just physical. But we know it's more than physical, right? If you think about it, you know that is not true. The Me Too movement showed us that. Sex is way more than physical. Ladies, if a guy in a bar walks up behind you and he pushes you in the back to move you out of the way, you're going to get over that pretty quickly. It may irritate you. But what if he touches you in an inappropriate way as he walks by in the bar? Feels very different, doesn't it? So if a grab under the shirt or a grope under the skirt is purely uh, physical, it's not emotional, it's not spiritual, then why does that feel different than when he touches your arm or your back? It's different because we know deep down that sex is way more than physical. It's a big deal. It's not no big deal. And, and so when culture tells us that sex is a big deal but sex is no big deal, we get this really confused messaging about sexuality. But, but if I'm honest with you, the, the, the church over the years has also given you some really confused uh, ideas about sexuality. Right? One of the things that the church has taught over the years is that sex is dirty and wrong and bad, so save it for the one you really love in marriage. How confusing is that about sexuality? So many churches talk about 
the don'ts of sexuality, but they don't talk about God's plan and the beauty of sexuality. And so we leave church thinking that the rules about sex are some outdated legalistic thing just trying to hold us back and keep us from enjoying life. But God's plan for intimacy is not that. It's not a rule. It is a plan and a purpose to make marriage a beautiful thing that reflects his love for us. It was intended to make his gift of marriage special. Sexual sin is a really big deal. And I think there's a tendency, though, for us to think that's a them problem. You know, as church people, we kind of feel like, okay, we hear this list of the sins. We're like, oh, no, no, no. That's a them problem, right? I mean, but we have to be very careful about making it an us versus them mentality. Because the reality is, I'm part of them, and so are you. We've all fallen short of God's plan for sexual intimacy. In in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was talking to a group of Jewish men, and he was talking to them about uh, these different Old Testament rules. And so he would set this up by saying, you have heard that it was said, and then he would tell them the Old Testament rule. But then he would follow that up and say, but I say, and then he would change the rule from being one of conduct to one of heart, or one of living out of your new identity in Jesus. See, the Jewish people, they were very good under the Old Testament law of following the letter of the law, but they were not good at following the heart of the law. And what we learn about Jesus is that he's all about heart. So in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, he says these words to this group of men. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that if anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Man, when he said the first part of that, I'm sure all the guys were going, yeah, we've heard that. We've even memorized that law. And you're not talking to us because we don't cheat on our spouse. But then he said the second part, and suddenly this group of Jewish men went from being us to being them. And, And we also are part of them. We've all fallen short of God's plan. And so we need to be very careful that we don't make this an us versus them mentality. It's not an issue about us versus them. It's not an issue about behavior. It's about heart. And ultimately, it's about what you believe. Not just about sexuality, but about God. How did you get here? Where are you going? Do you believe that there is an all-powerful, all-knowing God who loves you desperately and wants what's very best for you? And if you believe that, then you understand that God wants you to experience intimacy in his plan and for his purpose. He wants to make marriage special and unique. But more than that, he wants you to find primary fulfillment in him. See, so often we're looking for fulfillment in sexual intimacy with another person. But Jesus is saying, find your primary fulfillment. Find your primary intimacy with me. And so we have to do that. See, when Jesus talks about his relationship with us, he uses the imagery of a husband and a wife because that's the kind of intimacy that where we know he knows us intimately, knows all about us. That's the imagery. And, and so more than you can find completeness in sexual intimacy, you find completeness in Jesus. All right, look back at the, the rest of verse five. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he says, greed which is idolatry. So he moves on from one conduct that he believes will kill us and will kill us to another, and that's greed. And then he calls it idolatry. And and that's a big deal here because what he is saying is that money becomes an idol. And, And we know that's true. An idol is anything that competes for Jesus on the throne of our heart. And money is one of those things where we tend to put our trust, we put our faith, we put our hope, in money rather than God. And money promises some things in American culture that only God can deliver. Money whispers in your ear that it can give you security. Hey, if you just had more of me, you wouldn't have to worry about all those bills. Man, life would be so easy for you. Retirement would be taken care of if you just chase after me. If you just chase after me, you're going to find happiness and satisfaction. If you can get a little more of me, you're going to have wealth and success, and you're going to be more important. But money makes promises that it cannot keep. And we learn that when something turns wrong for us. We learn that when the stock market goes south. 
We learn that when the investment we put our money into fails. But, but we also learn that when someone very close to us gets sick or someone dies. Money cannot fix that. Money will not make you happy. It will not provide you comfort in those circumstances. Only God can do that. And yet, we allow ourselves to get taken in by money and we start to chase after it and we love it. And that leads to greed. And then greed begins to kill us because it begins to steal us of our joy and commitment. Greed robs us of so many things and ultimately it leads to our spiritual death. But if greed is the poison that leads to our death, generosity is the antidote with which we use to kill greed off. If we are generous back to God and we're generous with other people around us, we will find that we will kill off greed. And that's how that works. All right, look at verses 6 through 11. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, slave or free, but Christ is is all and is in all. Paul says, put these things to death because the wrath of God is coming. It's going to eventually lead to our spiritual death and we can't hang around with those old sins. We got to get rid rid of them. But then he says, you've taken off your old self. You're, You're not who you want. You're now a 1480 person. So live like a 1480 person. Live out of that identity. Our behavior flows out of identity. And then Paul throws in a few more things that we need to get rid of. He says we need to get rid of anger and malice. Man, anger is such a big deal for us. We need to be very slow to get angry and be very quick to let anger go because anger causes us to make big mistakes that hurt people, hurt relationships. We can really mess up and sin when we're in anger. And he says followers of Jesus, they don't say hurtful things about each other. They don't try to build themselves up by tearing someone else down. They don't try to spread rumors or lies. That's who you were, but but it's not who you are. And and then he says, don't lie, even when the truth is not easy. And he says, don't use filthy language. He says, that used to do that. That used to be who you are, but that's not who you are now. It's not a 1480 person. Live out of who you are. Live out of your new identity of being united with Christ into his death and his burial and his resurrection. All right, look at verses 12 through 14. Here, Paul is going to change from things we shouldn't do as individuals to things that we should do. So look what he says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So Paul says that because of who we now are, we need to put on some new things. We need to put on patience and humility and kindness and gentleness. And and, and then he talks about some other things that are so important. But I really want to focus on what he says about forgiveness here. Because forgiveness is tough. Man, if you are struggling with some bitterness or anger, you know what I'm talking about. Even for Christians, bitterness can be something that wears us down. And, And the reality is that As this follower of Jesus, when our identity has changed, the way we view forgiveness needs to change. It needs to be more of an adult forgiveness and not a child forgiveness. And and so Paul starts off by saying, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Well, what he's reminding us of here is you've been forgiven of a whole lot. Think of all the things you've done, all the things you haven't even done yet, and you've been forgiven of those. So he's saying if you've been forgiven of that, then you can forgive for the things that were done to you, even tough things. So Christian forgiveness isn't a childlike forgiveness. It's not like we used to think about it. See, childlike forgiveness is a very simple kind of forgiveness. There's two parts of childlike forgiveness, the apology and the acceptance. So here's how it works. If somebody does something wrong, they say, oh, I'm sorry, they make it right, and the other person accepts that apology and forgives them. That's a childlike view of forgiveness. And look, that actually works in some circumstances and very simple things. If you step on someone's foot in a restaurant, that works. 
If you use your wife as a sermon illustration without her permission, I've never done that, but for those people that have, that kind of works. But that forgiveness falls apart when the hurt is deep and there's not an apology. And so what a Christian forgiveness looks like is different than that. It is a mature and adult-like forgiveness. But what is accurate about this childlike understanding of forgiveness is there are two parts to it. But it's not the apology and the acceptance. The two parts of adult Christian forgiveness is right here. Listen to this. Two parts. Before and after. That's it. An apology isn't required because an apology often isn't going to happen in certain circumstances. If you're struggling with bitterness and a lack of forgiveness about something that was done to you, you know the before well. You know that the before is filled with anger and sadness and depression. You feel the tightness in your chest and your shoulders every time you think about the wrong that was done to you or even the person who did whatever it was done. You know that the before is destroying relationships. You know it's tearing down your self-esteem. It poisons your attitude. It keeps you from being the best husband or wife, the best parent or child, the best friend that you can be. It even hurts your relationship with Jesus because you feel guilty because you know you've been told to forgive and you can't make it happen. See, you only know one side of forgiveness. You know the side that hurts, but the, the after, it seems so far away. It seems so distant, so impossible to achieve. But we worship an all-knowing God. And, and see, God understands the before. He knows what you're going through now. He knows the hurt and the pain and the struggle. But he also sees the after. He sees the freedom. He sees the joy and, and all of the other things that you get, the peace. Whatever you've gone through, he sees the other side. He wants you to let that go and be free. And look, I know what some of you guys are thinking. Nathan, you, you, you don't know. You don't know what was done to me. You, you don't know how it's affected me, how it's changed relationships, how things that were just should be natural and normal are hard for me, how it sticks with me, how it tears me down and struggles, tears apart my joy and my peace. And, and you're right. I don't know. But I do know this. On the other side, in the after, there's peace, there's freedom, there's joy. See, whatever you're going through, whatever's been done to you, you can forgive if you follow what God did for you. All right, look at verse 15. Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. I love what Paul does here. He says that if we are in Christ and we know who he is and what he's done, peace is easy. He said there is no reason for groups of Christians to fight with one another. And if you notice now, Paul has shifted gears. He's now no longer talking about us as individuals. He's going to talk now for the rest of this sermon about how we interact as a church with one another. And he says, look, peace should be easy. If you know who Jesus is and what he's done, why would you fight? Why would you envy each other? Why would you want what each other have? You already have the grace of God. You have an eternity in heaven. And when you understand that, man, there's no reason for you guys to ever fight about anything. There shouldn't be discord. All right, look at the last section that we have time to talk about, and we'll pick up with the rest of chapter 3 next week. This is verses 16 through 17. Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So he's saying, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. Well, what does that mean? First of all, what is the message of Christ? The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one story. It is about God reconciling all things to himself through Jesus. 66 books, all in perfect unity about who Jesus is and what he's done. Well, that's the message of Christ. But what does it mean to let it dwell in you richly? Jesus makes it clear that Scripture is not just for the purpose of Scripture. That it is to draw us to him. 
And, and Jesus makes this point when he rebukes some Pharisees in John chapter 5. And he says here in verse 39 and 40, look at what he says. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's challenging Pharisees for reading the Bible because they're not reading it for the right purpose. Did you know there's actually Bible study that's completely worthless? Have you ever thought about that? There's actually Bible study that causes more harm than good. That's what's happening here. Because the Pharisees were using the Bible and their following of the rules to be better than other people and to, to move their importance up and their uh, power and authority. And, and Jesus is saying, look, the scriptures ought to lead you to me. That's what it means for the scriptures to dwell richly in you. We're not just readers of the word of God. We're partakers in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and so because of that, we should read the Bible in a different way. We're sponges of God's word. We, we need to try to soak it up. You don't read the word of God like it's the internet news or some newspaper or magazine. You read it to be changed by it. You dwell on it. You meditate on it. You think about it. You should feel the weight of it. You should let it expose you and transform you. The word of God has the power to help us through temptation, and it also has the power to be a rock for us when we're going through something hard and difficult. It should comfort us when we're uncomfortable, but it should also make us really uncomfortable when we get too comfortable in our relationship with Jesus. That's what it means. And Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. All right, and then Paul wraps up this section by telling them to sing and to praise God through worship together as a church. Have you ever thought about this? The worship has been a part of the church for thousands of years. But it will also be a part of the church all the way into eternity. The book of Revelation makes very clear that we'll continue to sing our praise to God in heaven. I don't think there's going to be preaching in heaven I don't think Jesus is going to call on me and say, hey, Brother Nathan, get up here. Give us the good word on Colossians 3. And make sure and throw it in some of those big Greek words you like to talk about. That's not going to happen because we are in the presence of God. We will know the scripture. But in heaven, it's very clear that we're going to continue to sing praise to God. And before we get to heaven, when we sing praise together as a church, we're drawn closer to God. When we worship through song as a church family, it, it's this moment where heaven and earth are kind of united because the book of Revelation makes very clear that there are people right now, there are angels, there are elders, there are people singing and praising God right now. And so in just a minute, we're going to sing and praise God and we're going to join with all of creation to praise our God. And in that moment, our church enters this kind of, I'll call it a convergent space this place where the boundary between heaven and earth becomes a little less clear, a little less permanent, and we are praising God with heaven. And then out of that connection of praise comes power. And out of that connection comes emotion. When we hear a sermon, we're mostly connecting to God and to his message with our brain. Right? You're, you're hearing what I say, and you're trying to apply that to your life and see how it can change you. And, and I get that sometimes the sermon can be emotional. Some of you guys cry every Sunday. You don't count. You're not who I'm talking about. But when we sing, we're connecting our heart to our head. Let, let me be very clear here. Emotion without worship, that's just a sad song. It's not what I'm talking about. But emotion in worship means that we are worshiping God, not just with our minds, but with all of ourselves, with our hearts. In, in this third chapter of Colossians, Paul tells us what our life should look like when we follow Jesus. Our identity has changed. We're now a 1480 person, and that affects who we are. See, if you keep living out of the flesh, it's going to eventually catch up with you, and it will kill you. For 13 years, Timothy Treadwell lived with the bears and everything seemed to be all right. After he was killed, I heard there was a, a, one of the park officials said he, he couldn't understand why Treadwell thought this wouldn't end terribly. But I kind of understand what Treadwell was thinking. See, he, he thought he could tame these bears. He, he thought he could make them his pets. But a thousand pound grizzly bear is not your pet. It cannot be tamed and eventually it will kill you. If you get caught with a grizzly bear, you're either gonna kill it or it's going to kill you. 
And see, that's the same thing with those fleshly desires. You can't continue to hang out with them. You will not tame them. You will not control them. Maybe you'll do it for a little while, but eventually you got to kill them off or they're going to get to you. Don't continue to live like the person that you once were. You are a new creation. You are different. You have a new identity. And out of that identity flows how you live, how you think, how you act, how you talk. Take your eyes off the distractions of this world, off the sin and the struggle and the hurt and even the joys and success. Put a little less emphasis on that and keep your eyes focused on the one thing that really matters. Stay focused on Jesus. Let's pray.